Before you install a ceramic coating, this, Ivan, is the video for you. Hi, I'm Ivan. I'm Nick. This is DIY Detail. We're gonna go more in depth into the practices and the best ways of preparing and applying your ceramic coating. This is like an instruction manual, but we're skipping through all the boring stuff. We're getting to write what you need to know. So, Ivan, where do we start? Well, first of all, the paint itself. You need perfectly clean paint, which means no waxes, no oils, no grease, nothing on the paint. And the best way to do that is A, a proper decontamination wash. So we're going to wash the vehicle, nice contact wash. Then we're gonna use the perforated synthetic decontamination towel with iron remover. That's getting part of the contamination off. Next, water spot remover. And the reason for water spot remover is we're actually removing mineral content on the vehicle. You may not have water spots, but you may have a thin film of minerals from drying and from water on the surface that you don't see, but they're there. So we need to remove those as well. Finally, you might have some wax left over. You might have some sealant left over. You have a brand new car. The dealership may have put something on that vehicle. If that's the case, the only way to remove those is actually to polish. And a lot of people, you're afraid of polishing. Don't be afraid. There'll uh, be a, a video down below to show you a quick, easy, simple way of polishing without spending three or $400 on a tool, without an elaborate setup. You can do this yourself quite easily and at zero or very, very low risk. You'd have to purposely screw up here. Preparation is key. Yeah. It absolutely sets the foundation for whether your coating is gonna bond in the way that it should. Right. And the way that will maximize its performance and longevity. Exactly. The next step, and this is one that, you know, detailers tend to, let's say, uh, improvise on sometimes. And that is the panel prep. Now, we have our own panel prep, and it's there for a reason. There are many companies selling coatings, many companies selling a panel prep, and everybody's panel prep is compatible to their coating. It may not be compatible to ours, and we're not gonna go out and buy 6,000 different types of panel preps and test them all and say, oh, this one doesn't work, and this one works, and this one doesn't work. No, we provide a panel prep. It's inexpensive, and it works with our coatings. Now, if you're installing another brand of coating, I will tell you not to use our panel prep, to use theirs if they have their own panel prep. It's engineered to work together. And we have some people that say, oh, but I've installed your coatings with another band of, brand of panel prep and it worked fine. It might have, yes, but may not have gone well either. And these are things that just take a long time for you to notice in terms of the performance. And if it's a customer's vehicle, that's one thing, right? Because they're paying you. But if it's your vehicle, you want to do this right the first time, right? If it's your vehicle and you're not doing this professionally, yeah. you don't want to go out and repolish the car and apply the coating again. And no. It's just, you want to do it right the first time. Right. So don't skimp on the panel prep side. No. And there's a, a lot of other things that people use for panel prep. One is isopropyl alcohol. Wrong answer. Isopropyl alcohol, leave it in your medicine cabinet at home. It has nothing to do with detailing. Just don't bring it into your detailing environment. It doesn't do a good job. It does not remove polishing oils. All it does is give you a false impression, it's a placebo, that you've done something. But in reality, it's not doing much. A lot of people use isopropyl alcohol, though. It seems right. to give your windows a streak-free shine. It seems to clean the panel. People are gonna say, why would I spend money on panel prep when I can get this bottle for three bucks at Walgreens? Right, because it's drying out the paint, there's a scratch risk, and it's not removing the polishing oils that you're using it to remove. It's not removing greases and oils as well as a dedicated panel prep. Now, the other aspect is some people use a body shop prep solvent, and a body shop prep solvent is even worse because it actually purposely leaves solvent on the surface. It's designed to swell paint. It's designed to make old paint receptive to new paint. So it's not doing you a good service. The other aspect of the panel prep is with our panel prep and other companies are the same. They're engineered to work with the coating. And if you were to wipe a small section with IPA and wipe another small section with our coating or with our panel prep and then install the coating, you'll see that the section that has our panel prep on it is actually easier to install the coating it prepares the surface properly to receive the coating. The applicator glides easier, the coating levels a lot better. 
What if someone doesn't use panel prep? Uh, you're just compromising the longevity of the coating, and depending on the compounds and polishes you use, you may really be shortening that aspect. Uh, those of you that have installed lots of coatings and you've tried different compounds and polishes, things like that, sometimes you'll apply a coating and it hazes. Well, that hazing is the coating is actually trying to do the job of the panel prep and it is encountering oils and solvents on the surface and it's floating them to the surface of the, uh, of the coating. And that's where that hazing comes from. That sounds like a nightmare. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And I had hazing with one ceramic coating brand I used back in the day and it was no fun. Yeah. Basically, you don't want a coating that's difficult to install. No. Use the proper techniques and steps that we're saying. We're explaining it because we know that's what everybody wants. They want the deep dive, the why, right? Yeah. Eventually, I come to the agreement with you of like, okay, if Ivan says we do it this way, like there's a reason for it. 40 years experience in the detailing industry. but. A lot of times, detailers want to know the why first. Right. We're just like, we're pesky like that. Yeah, exactly. And the why is basically, we have spent countless, you know, months actually, uh, in R&D to develop a proper panel prep to go with our coating. And so have many other companies. Just trust that R&D process. If there is a panel prep available for the coating you're using, if, not you, if you're not using DIY detail coating, I'm gonna tell you not to use our panel prep. Yes, it may work, it may work beautifully, but if that company has their own dedicated panel prep, then yes. And if a company doesn't have their own dedicated panel prep, to me that raises a red flag as to their R&D process. Right, because the coating is gonna last based on the prep, and part of the prep is Panel prep. Exactly. Not everyone calls it panel prep. They may call it paint prep, they, surface you know, prep. Yeah, whatever. Whatever they call it, but it's it's a preparation step. So we spent an inordinate amount of time talking about panel prep for a reason, because this is your final process before laying on the ceramic coating. Right. And that's why it's so critical. Right, and the panel prep is cheap, the coating is expensive, and you want to make that coating last as long as possible. Give it every chance you can by using the proper steps beforehand. I always enjoy the panel prep process because you've spent a long time, or at least I used to, on the paint polishing stage, right. which doesn't take too long using our methods, actually. Yeah. But uh, maybe you've two-stepped it, compounded and polished it, right? You've, you've gotten that paint to where you think it's visually just Mwah. Yeah. And then the panel prep is your final like reward before you lay on the coating. It, well, it's very satisfying to me. It's satisfying, and it's also your final inspection. Yes. So it's your final chance to get it right uh, before applying the coating. The other aspect of that, you mentioned a two-step, a compound and a polish. Some compounds and some polishes are just filled with what the industry calls fillers. And no, there's not someone in the, the factory going, hey, you forgot to put that five gallons of fillers in the, uh, the, you know, the, the coating mix, or the, not the polish. coating mix, the polish mix or the compound mix. No, the fillers or what people perceive as fillers are solvents and oils that are very difficult or very tenacious to remove, and some of them actually swell the paint, meaning that you compound, you polish, it looks really good, let it sit in the sun for a couple of weeks and you might start seeing hazing and you might start seeing marks. That is the swelling gone, going down as, this, as those solvents evaporate. The solvents and uh, oils that some compounds and polishes use are not affected at all by IPA. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, you may need something a little harsher. Now, if you're not sure about if your polish or compound is filling, there's an easy, easy test you can do. Wet sand in area, so it's dull. And you don't need to go to 1,000 grit. I'm talking three or 5,000 grit. You just want a dull an area. Or take a compound on a wool pad and just dull an area. Once it's dull, then, take your compound or polish of choice and just dab it on the surface. You're not wiping it on, there's no mechanical action going on here. It's just a chemical action. Dab it on the surface, let it sit for two or three minutes, and dab it off. Again, no mechanical rubbing. If you see a difference, if it's brightened up that paint by not polishing, by just being applied, then you know it's putting something into the paint. Mm, interesting. Now, if you want to test your, uh, if you want to do the IPA test, so find a polish that actually does fill and has lots of oils and solvents in it. Once you've done a section, 
do an IPA wipe and you'll see that it does nothing other than it felt like you were wiping something off. Do another section and you can do what I call the truth serum. So in R&D process, when we're testing compounds and polishes, this is the way we do it. We start off by making sure that you know we have a nice even surface, we've done everything we need to do. Then we actually use all clean at five to one dilution. So a much, much heavier dilution than when we'd normally do. But we don't wipe off the whole area, we just wipe off half to see if there's a difference. So we put on the all clean at a five to one dilution, let it sit for a couple seconds, wipe it off, inspect. If there's no difference, so far so good. The final one, and this is something that uh, body shops have used for decades when they're having problems with fish eyes. So a body shop that normally uses the, the panel solvent that they're used to using, and all of a sudden they're getting fish eyes. And fish eyes is a condition of paint, you can Google it, that it's basically a little drop of silicone is adhering or preventing the paint from adhering to that one little spot. And it creates what looks like a fish eye in the paint. The, to remove fish eyes, when a body shop is just pulling their hair out, nothing is working, a mixture of one-third acetone and two-thirds original blue Windex. Basically, it's their last ditch effort to make sure that the paint is perfectly clean and then if they're still getting fish eyes, then it's in their process at somewhere else. But for that, for a coating as well, that's what I use in R&D to make sure that when I'm testing polishes, things like that, that they're not leaving anything behind. So if you don't have access to a commercial panel prep, you're in a rush, that is probably the best mixture you can make other than using the company's panel prep. Very interesting. Uh, I've never tried it, but I know you've mentioned it many times. And, yeah. And uh, I, I would lean on that if I didn't have our panel prep, but right. it's not the way that we designed it. No. So if you're buying a coating, buy the panel prep that goes with it. It's an inexpensive insurance for you. <laughs> you probably are astounded at how long we've been talking about panel prep. But we're not done. No. There's a two towel method that's very critical when doing our panel prep wipe down. I used to just spray panel prep on the surface, yeah. which first of all, you want to spray on the towel. And then second, I used to just use one towel, and as soon as I couldn't see the panel prep anymore, I'm like, we're good. Right. So basically what Nick was doing was emulsifying the oils on the surface and then rubbing them back in. Uh, it's the way to do it, man. Yeah, exactly. So it felt and, like it was working. And you've seen a lot of YouTube influencers do it the same way. It's the way they were taught. It's not that they're trying to mislead you. It's just that they were not prepped or were not taught the proper way. And a lot of companies that sell products actually don't make their own products. And in that instance, they don't really have a deep fundamental understanding of what they're selling you because they're not formulating it. They're not making it. That kind of makes sense in remembering my rep at the time and how yeah. it, was, it didn't really feel like they knew much about what was going on. They were good to me. Oh yeah. They took care of me. They wanted me to sell ceramic coatings. Yeah. They were very supportive of my growth, but they didn't really know the products and looking back, it's like, because they didn't make them. No. So to me, a company that tells you, oh yeah, use what you want as a panel prep, eh, raises a couple red flags. That being said, for panel prep, as Nick mentioned, take a short nap microfiber towel. I like a pearl weave. Again, it's up to you on this one. Spray a liberal amount on your towel, and then you apply it to the surface, but before it evaporates, because the panel prep evaporates quickly, before it evaporates, come back with another towel and wipe it clean. What you're doing now is the panel prep is doing its job. It's emulsifying and it's floating any oils, waxes, sealants to the surface of the panel prep and then you're wiping it off before it dries back into the paint. With I like a different color, fluffier towel. Right. It could be short nap as well. It can be short nap, it can be any towel you want. And to Nick's point, having two different colors is really good because at this point you're wearing gloves. You can't tell which one is the wet one, which one is the dry one. Right, and the one that you're getting wet, it's very easy to confuse the two and then all of a sudden you're just, uh, you're yeah. not doing it the right way. No, exactly. So use two different color towels. You can use the nap of towel you want, the style of towel you want. We use two different colors. That way it's easy to, to track. We're detailers. So, I mean, you could do a ceramic coating by not polishing, by not applying panel prep. You wash the car, you slap the coating on. It's going to perform for a while, right? Right. But you want it to perform for years and years. Did, yeah. you, did you get the ceramic coating because you believed in what it was and how we tell you it works? Or do you just want it to work for a little amount of time?
because there's, there's definitely a range of outcomes and a range of prep and we want to get you the most you, you can, at least if you're exactly. interested in that. We want to at least open that door for you and be like, here's how you get the most out of this coding. Right. Follow it the way we say. Yeah. Next, the application itself. And this is somewhere, this is something that a lot of people, they stress inordinately about getting it on and getting it right and doing it properly. The most basic instruction I can give you for applying a ceramic coating is get it on the paint. It doesn't matter how you do it. You just get it on the paint and then level the high spots. Now, there's a little finer, uh, finer aspects of it. First of all, getting it on the paint. I've always used a circular motion and there's a number of reasons for that. And a lot of companies uh, condone or say to use a cross, -hatch, cross hatching motion. And if you want to use a cross hatching motion, which is left to right, then up and down, fine. That will work with our coatings as well. But circular motion has a couple advantages to it. One is, it's a lot easier on your body to do this than to stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. So it's mm. one continual motion. That one continual motion also, at the same time, is laying down the coating a lot more evenly, reducing the incidence or chance of high spots. Because every time you stop, you're actually putting a bit of pressure there, coming back, and you're leaving a, a row of high spots wherever you've stopped. So that is one consideration. There's no pressure at the end of your stroke when you're doing circles? No. It's, no, it's just, yeah. okay, it makes sense. Yeah, when you're doing it right, it's just a nice, even circular motion. The circular motion as well, and this is counterintuitive to a lot of people, and a lot of companies are going, don't tell them that, uh, uses less product because you're, you can spread it out thinner. And contrary to popular belief, this is the coding Illuminati, Ivan. They're sitting here watching it. Don't tell them the secrets. Yeah, no, but basically, the cross hatching pattern uses more coding, and there's no reason to use more coding. As long as you have coding deposited on the paint, that's all you need. A thick layer of coding is not a thick layer of coding. Uh, you're not putting more on. All you're doing is taking more off with your leveling towel. If your leveling towel is getting wet, that's a red flag. It should never get wet. You should be able to do a whole car with one leveling towel and it still be dry at the end. Because, well, no, I want to get to the leveling towel, but we haven't even talked about drops. So usually we do like 10 to 12 drops on our red foam applicator. Right. And we like to start on the hood because that gives us a, a very easy canvas to work. It's horizontal, we can see it. It's not sloping on us, right? So we just get a sense of it and then we box the section after we put the applicator pad in the center. We just want to sort of see how it's laying down. Right. And then we box like half the hood. Yeah. And, you know, the 10 or 12 drops, you count them roughly. Then from there, the pad is primed. The applicator pad is primed. You don't need to put 10 or 12 drops on every panel. From there, it's one or two drops per panel. Maybe three. Not a lot. And to Nick's point there, we did a, a hood the other day, it was a smaller car. Uh, I actually did the whole hood without putting more product on the, the applicator because it was a small hood. But, but after that, when you put one or two drops on the applicator pad and you go to your next panel, you start by boxing that, right. that section you're working, right? Yeah. But, but in the beginning on that hood, you start in the center and it almost, it, it, it looks fairly wet. Like why do you yeah. start in the center on the hood and then box the rest, the yeah. rest, yeah. So the reason I start in the center is I know I have too much on my applicator pad. And I don't want it running. You can actually make a coating run on paint. Nick's done a great job of that. Run, like you times. see like drips down yeah, the exactly. side, right? And you don't, you don't think it's a big deal. You're like, hey, I'm getting the coating on the paint. Yeah. Watch that high spot you didn't see early up yeah. here in the sun the next day. Yeah, exactly. So basically, by starting in the center, I'm not putting a run down the side of the panel. So. If I tried to box the outside with that much coating on the applicator, I'm going to get a little run of coating going off the edge of the hood and onto the cowl, or off the edge of the hood and onto the fender, or between the fender and the hood. So, and if you're watching in the UK, the bonnet. But nonetheless, so I start in the center and just spread further and further and further. As long as I'm spreading coating, I don't need to apply more. And if you're working on a light colored car, a white, a pearlescent white is the worst, or a silver car, yes, it's very difficult to see the coating. And you may actually want to turn the lights off in your detailing studio. If you're working outside, you can't. But if you're inside, turn the lights off and just have one light off in the, or one light on in the corner somewhere. That way you can 
see the rainbow effect a little better. Now, you've applied the coating and we want you to apply it as thin as possible. We want you to try to be as cheap as possible with that coating and stretch it out. As long as you're getting the panel damp or wet with coating, it's great. Too much coating, it may look like you've done a great job and then you get high spots. They come back to bite you because of what's happened. And what's happening is you're putting the coating on and the way the, the carrier solvents work is they come through the coating, depositing the coating on the paint, and they come to the top, and that's that rainbow effect that we're getting. So it's just the solvents, really, is, is the rainbow? Right. It's the solvents and you know the coating that's there. But we want you to apply the coating, see the rainbow, and then when about 50% of the rainbow effect has gone away, that means the solvent has evaporated, and you're just left with the coating, then you level it. And your leveling towel, the lowest nap towel, preferably a pearl weave you can possibly use, is the best towel for this. And then you want, I like a fluffier second towel, a different color. So as the almost, insurance wipe. As the yeah. insurance wipe after that. So same thing as panel prep, right? Initial right. wipe with your leveling towel, then you have a fluffy towel as your insurance wipe. People are gonna want a time. They're gonna want, how long do I wait after I apply the coating until I level it, right? They want 30 seconds, they want this, they want that. Yeah. Um, I guess the best way to describe it is there's like a five minute maximum yeah. where we'll give you, but it has a lot more to do with temperature and humidity. Right, and we can't give you an exact, it's you know, 39 seconds, no. Uh, at least a minute, sometimes more, up to five. The reason for all the variables, Temperature and humidity, those two are the variables. Now, if you're in a space where your temperature is maintained at 70 degrees year round and your humidity is maintained at 39% year round or 40% or whatever, it doesn't matter, then you can unequivocally say, it's gonna take me two minutes and 18 seconds before I need to wipe off. None of us work in a lab, so. No. There's a lot of variables. You've washed a car recently. Uh, you have water on the floor. There, you know, there's humidity in the air. So it's very difficult to get that precise. And this is where learning how to read the coating or look at the coating is very important. And it's basically, as we said, you apply the coating. And if you can't see it on your paint, there's a little uh, trick we have. Most cars, the back windows are tinted. On a tinted window, you can see exactly what's happening. Now, the cross-linking is faster on glass than it is on paint. With glass or your external trim, yeah, I like to lay the coating down and level it right away. Exactly. Uh, that, that seems to work the best for me. But right. is that gonna wet my leveling towel? A little bit. Yeah. So I like to save glass till last. Yeah. Oh boy, we're, we're throwing out different, different directions. Go right. this so way, that, go that yeah. way. Uh, so that, but if uh, you have white paint, you never level the coating before, right. you may want to try the glass first just to be like, what does this look like? Yeah. Because you, you won't see it on the white. You'll see it on glass. And otherwise, if it's not white paint, try the hood first. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If, it's, if it's not white or you know, light silver paint, and, or you're, on white, you can't actually see it if your lighting is correct. So sure. you may want to play with the lighting a little bit. Like I said, having a bright room is great on a dark car. On a light color car, it may not be the best. So often it's sunset and sunrise outside, I see the coatings. Yeah. Or a cloudy day, I'll see a high spot. Or like soft box light in a dark garage, you can see you know, the, yeah. your rainbow and your high spot. So a play with your lighting. It'll make sense once you try this stuff. But if you don't see the coating going on and it's darker paint in your shop or garage, yeah. be like, what could I do to change the lighting to maybe less light, to maybe angling the way I look at it? And once you start to see the rainbows, you'll be like, okay, I get it now. Yeah. But until you see it, it's hard to know what you're right. talking about. We want you to see the rainbow. We want you to wait till you get about 50% of the, the rainbow that dissipates, comes back to clear. Then it's time to level. Now, can you level too soon? Yes and no. Once you've <laughs> applied the coating to the paint, it's already there. The, you could level immediately if you wanted to, and it's not going to really affect the longevity of the coating. It's gonna reduce it a little bit, but not much. By waiting till you have that 50% evaporation, then you're good to go, that's great. If you wait longer, it's just creating a little more work for you, and the high spots will wipe off within, you know, you can stretch it to five, maybe 10 minutes sometimes, and that high spot will still easily wipe off.
One thing I will tell you with your leveling towel. Yeah. If it's easy to wipe, you're in the clear. If right. it's kind of grabby, that's when it's too soon. That's when your towel is going to get wet. So another non-visual cue is, is it a smooth wipe off or is it a little grabby? If it's a little grabby, like Ivan said, yeah. you're not really affecting the longevity of the coating, but your leveling towel is going to get wet. It's just too soon. And right. then once your leveling towel gets wet, it's harder for you to level. It feels like you're just wiping coating into different directions. and it, You just don't want your leveling towel getting wet, right? right? And a lot of people will call this step wiping off the coating. And if you're wiping off coating, that's a red flag. You should just be leveling. So the high spots that we're leveling, the leveling towel being the short nap that it is, and a pearl weave is, a pearl weave is not a very absorbent towel. So what's happening is, those high spots, you're just spreading them thinner. What's happening to the solvent as you're doing that? The solvent at this point should be evaporated. That grabbiness that you feel is the solvent. Got it. So if it's evaporated, you're just leveling the excess of the coating. Yeah. And it just should be on a little bit, a little bit in your towel maybe, but yeah. barely anything, and then mostly on the paint. Exactly. So that's that aspect. Then we have the what we call the insurance wipe. You just take a nice fluffy towel and go over it. First of all, it's a lot of fun because the coating is immediately slick and it's just, you feel this slickness. The other thing is, it's just ensuring that you're removing the high spots. Man, it's a weird thing to spend this long talking about it and not reference the fact that we have links to all these products below. If you're like, what towel do I use? What towel do they recommend? What coatings do they have? It's like, it's all in the description below. Yeah, and we've done a numerous amount of videos on ceramic coating, so you can see those as well. But uh, a lot of people ask questions. Oh, like they haven't seen yeah. these videos yet. It's like, okay, based on your questions, which we love, by the way. Yes. Comment down below. We answer them all on YouTube. If you're listening to this podcast, reach out to us as well. Follow our YouTube channel, subscribe. We answer these questions and they also help us know what questions you have and what content we can make to serve you guys better. Exactly, because we're here for education. Yes, we're selling products, but the whole goal of the DIY Detail YouTube channel and the podcast is to educate, is to make detailing fun, is to make it easier on you. So back to our coding application. I think it's fun to educate, by the way. If you it can't is. tell, we actually yeah. like doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. All right, uh, you are the master educator, but I'm a teacher at heart as well. Yeah. All right, so we've got the two towels. Leveling right. towel, insurance wipe, right. right? And I have this one question in my head, I'll throw it out at you and then stop yeah. interrupting you, but it breaks my heart when I get these messages from people who say, I tried to coat my whole F-150 and I didn't make it all the way through, right? right. You guys lied to me. This bottle of coating wasn't enough. And I'm like, oh, I, I wish I could just teach them in person how little they need to apply. Right. Um, so before we get any further, I wonder if we could address that. Yeah. So basically, especially if you're a first time coding applicator, first time you're doing it, everyone errs on the side of more is better. And more is not better. So like we say, the first time, 10 or 12 drops. After that, limit yourself to two drops. And if your applicator pad starts dragging, your applicator pad starts sounding squeaky, and the first time you use it, it'll sound squeaky until you get it all lubricated. Then add a few more drops, but don't be adding five or six drops at a time, just two at a time. Limit yourself to two at a time, go as far as you can with those two drops, and then come back and level, and then go as far as you can with another two drops. And you'll see that that F-150, you can actually do two out of one bottle. And if you don't believe you're actually laying coating down on the paint, there's a couple things you can do with your applicator pad. Yeah. After just a couple of drops when you reapply, try a window. Yeah. And kind of put a little bit of pressure on a window and realize how much coating is actually in there. Or try some trim like on the side mirror. Yeah. You know, some trucks that, you know, a lot of that is just plastic right. trim. And, and press kind of a little hard, right? Just on, just on trimmer windows, not ever on paint. But realize there's still a lot of coating in there. So Definitely. you don't think there's a lot there there's plenty. Yeah, there's so, so that'll give you some reassurance that okay, it actually is laying it down. Yeah. And, you know, to address the oh, but more is better. More is a uh, a lot more work for you. First of all, it's harder to it's harder to apply when you're actually using more coating. It's harder to level. And more importantly is the way the coating cures is from the top down. So the solvent has evaporated it forms a crust on the outside. And that crust with our coatings, one hour after you've applied it, you can drive in the rain, you can drive in the snow, it's not a big deal. But the underlying coating is still curing. It takes about a week for it to cure. But 
you've applied it super thick, you've leveled it, there's no high spots, it's beautiful. You're working on black paint, so you can see the high spots. You're guaranteed, in your mind, I have no high spots. You're proud. You're the world's best detailer and you're gonna let the world know on Instagram yeah. and Facebook. So as you're posting on Instagram and Facebook, you come back afterwards and see where all these high spots come from. That's because the coating is still coming up and the solvent, because you put so much on, is still coming up through that little crust and creating a high spot. And I've seen people that they've had to go back and wipe high spots two and three times because, okay, I have it leveled, there's no more high spots, they come back in half an hour and it's back. Right. But that's also the same person that used a bottle, a whole bottle, to do a small car. Right. And you should be able to get two full sedans <coughs> out of a bottle. Easily. Yeah. What order do you recommend? I always tell people, uh, save wheels and windows and plastic trim for last. Yeah, for me, I generally do the plastic trim as I'm going. Okay. Uh, just it's, it's easier and you know, I, I'm not trying to think that, oh, I have to yeah. cut out around this plastic, this molding, I'll no, just do it. As far as the windows, yes, and the wheels, I leave those to last. Now, the wheels, we do not offer a wheel coating for a reason. 90% or even a much higher percentage if it's a factory wheel, I can pretty much guarantee that it has clear coat on it or powder coating. Clear coat, powder coating on the wheel is the same clear coat that's on the rest of the car. So you don't need a dedicated wheel coating. That's just great marketing. Uh, you don't really need that. Now, if it's a metal wheel, so polished aluminum or stainless steel or uh, chrome wheel, then you'll use our metal coating. It's actually designed to bond to raw metal, not clear coated metal raw metal. Now, for your wheels, yeah, leave them till last. And a little trick I can give anyone is actually don't ceramic coat your wheels. Now, mine are ceramic coated, but we have this thing called quick beads. And quick beads, if you are maintaining your car on a regular basis and you use a hose or pressure washer, then quick beads is your best friend when it comes to wheels because you prep it properly, and if it's a brand new car, take the, or brand new wheels, take the time to prep them and ceramic coat them. It's not that difficult to do. Like if you get wheels that aren't even on the car yet, yeah. wipe it down with panel prep and then ceramic coat it. Like right. that, that's, that is the way to do yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Because you probably spent money on those wheels. Exactly. But on the other hand, uh, quick beads is phenomenal on wheels because one or two sprays, and then you hit it with the hose and it's protected till the next time you wash it. You, you have clean wheels first. Yeah, Clean definitely. and wet wheels, then you spray, then you rinse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we have a you know, plethora of videos on quick beads as well, so you can take a look at those. But quick beads are just phenomenal on wheels. Other areas that people have a bit of a concern or a bit of a problem with, a lot of the grills on the front of cars now are so convoluted and you know, they're, they're beautiful to look at, they're works of art, but to get in there and coat every one of those little notches and bumps and all, it's a pain. Again, that's where quick beads comes in. Now, you don't want to do that before you ceramic coat your car, you want to do that after the first wash. So you're coating, you let it sit for a week, you drive it, whatever, resist the urge to wash for a week. But then you can use quick beads on those more intricate areas that are difficult to do. And then you'll use it on your wheels again, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's but great. I, back to the original point, because we sort of went off the track there. The, I save the glass to last. And the reason I save the windows to last is now I can actually apply a bit of pressure to my applicator. So at this point, I'm actually not applying any more to my applicator. I'm just pressing a little harder and squeezing all the coating out of the applicator. The more we remove from the applicator, the better it is. And again, you're not applying more coating and you're getting all your windows coated. And you can see just how far you can go. On paint, we never want to apply pressure. Never. But on the glass, not a problem. Pressure away. Folks, we hope that you've enjoyed this podcast. We've said a lot of this before in disparate podcasts, but we wanted to bring it all together and then YouTube videos. And just you know, everything you need to know about applying a ceramic coating, I do want to also offer this tip, when you're done with your applicator and your leveling towel and your insurance towel, 
put it in your bucket of rinseless wash or incredible suds, whatever you use to prep the vehicle, yeah. and that's gonna stop the cross-linking of the coating into exactly. your towels, which will then prevent your towels from getting hydrophobic. Right. And if they're hydrophobic, they bead water just like the coating on your paint, yeah. and they no longer absorb it, and you have towels to be absorbent. So just soak them in your wash bucket for 30 minutes, yeah. overnight, whatever you want, then put them in your wash. Right. You know, every coating company will tell you, don't wash the car for seven days. The reason for that is surfactants will potentially damage the coating that you've put on the, the surface. We're purposely taking our applicator towels and pad and putting them in surfactants because we want the coating to be damaged on those. And you don't need to throw the towels away when you're done. You don't need to throw the applicator away when you're done. They'll, they'll be good for another day. Uh, the other aspect, the last final thing is, what do I do if I get a bird bomb? What do I do if I get bugs on the front of my car? That's where rinseless wash becomes a necessity. You don't want to be washing the whole vehicle. You want to target that specific area. You want to target just that bird bomb. And you can use our waterless wash, you can use our rinseless wash. Those are two great solutions for just those targeted areas. If you want to know the difference between a waterless wash and a rinseless wash, this would be a great time, Ivan, for us to point to this here episode of the DIY Detail Podcast where we answer your questions yep. and hopefully make you a rinseless and waterless wash master. Mm -hmm.